We will now continue with our panel discussion, session five on financing SIM. And I would like to give the floor to the moderator, His Excellency Peter F. Gonta. Satu, dua. Yeah. All right, good morning, I would say, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Indonesia-Africa Infrastructure Dialogue. I have uh, with me here on stage, uh, I will not talk and read their CV because as I will be asking them the question, as they will be saying what they have on their hearts about what they want to say here in this conference, we will display their uh, curriculum vitae and you'll be able to uh, know what their, their current position is and what uh, their previous or historical background is. So thank you very much, uh, lady and gentlemen here on stage. Um, I first would like to start and ask uh, the question and will give the opportunity to His Excellency uh, Minister of Economic and Finance of Madagascar, Richard Radiaman, Radiamandranto. Sounds like an Indonesian name. I don't know if there, there are some, you have some Indonesian ancestors, but uh, Excellency, uh, what are the kind of opportunities, what are the kind of issues, what are the kind of uh, uh, possibilities and opportunities that there is between Madagascar and Indonesia, Indonesia and the African nations uh, in general? And I would like to give you five minutes or four to five minutes to express and to mention whatever you have on your heart. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. First uh, and foremost, uh, we appreciate uh, the invitation by the government of uh, Indonesia uh, for having extended uh, the invitation for Madagascar. Uh, this morning I read uh, that uh, uh, Indonesia has about uh, 17,000 or so islands. It's an archipelago. And I think uh, they forgot Madagascar because uh, despite the fact that uh, Madagascar is an island far away from the archipelago where we are now, we share a lot of values. And as you rightly said, we also have the same ancestors. I feel like uh, Indonesian uh, and many Indonesians also uh, uh, feel like Malagasy. So uh, this is history. So when I uh, listen to the discussions yesterday and this morning, I, uh, uh, I have the same feeling that uh, we can do a lot of things uh, together. Uh, that said, Opportunities are there, and this morning the, the fourth session mentioned the opportunity in uh, oil, crude oil production, uh, already tapped by Madagascar Oil. Uh, I appreciate uh, the intervention of uh, the CEO of Madagascar Oil. This is a great, great project for Madagascar to be spotted uh, in the uh, international arena. Uh, right now, Madagascar all is about to produce uh, 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 more than uh, 80 to 100 barrel uh, thousand a day. Um, and the government of Madagascar will very soon look into the transportation of that crude oil from the uh, Tsimiruru site, which is roughly about 200 kilometers from the, the coast. Uh, there is a uh, railway um, project uh, to transport that oil to uh, the Maitiranu Maritime Port. We are also considering uh, a pipeline to do that uh, transportation, but there are still some chemical uh, magics to be able to transport the, the crude oil. Uh, of course, the road uh, from that side to the port must be also uh, built. 
So there, uh, this afternoon, uh, I'm going to have a uh, working uh, meeting with uh, Exim Bank to find a way to uh, address the financing needs uh, for uh, Madagascar oil. But there are much more than that. Um, raw materials from, uh, for example, the palm oil, the, the cloves, um, and other products like that will be also uh, considered uh, for uh, financing because we are talking about financing scheme here. Um, in that sense, let me uh, share also the information that uh, we are working the, with the Africa 50, uh, which is a, uh, um, a project uh, already going on um, uh, by African Development Bank. And indeed, on uh, many projects uh, in dam construction and road construction, we are going to work with Africa 50 um, for uh, new uh, financing uh, uh, schemes. Um, last but not least, let me mention that for the time being, Madagascar is still being considered by the IMF and the World Bank as a low-income country. Uh, and therefore, we are uh, eligible to concessional loans. But, but, we are much more ambitious than what uh, is needed to make Madagascar a developed uh, uh, nation in the next 20 years. This morning I heard that uh, Indonesia has a very bold ambition, like uh, having a, a seven times uh, double the, the per capita income. We also have that ambition. For the time being, we are at the 400 uh, dollar per capita, and we think that by end of 2023, we should double that uh, per capita income. Uh, to reach $800, uh, dollars. and then in the next 10 years, we also want to double the 800 to 1,600 per capita. We need that bold uh, ambition, otherwise we can't be able to develop the country. Uh, and therefore, I think that uh, Indonesia and Madagascar should work together to reach that, uh, uh, that goal of uh, you know, working together under the brotherhood spirit, under the, the trust, because it was mentioned this morning. And uh, uh, to conclude this first part, I would say that uh, we also need not to look at Africa as just a one continent with the same way of doing things. I think Africa is a huge continent. It's much bigger than Southeast Asia, uh, it's much bigger than America, it's much bigger than other continents. So we, there are many opportunities in Africa, but also in individual countries. We work the way we do things. Uh, it was mentioned this morning that the, the free trade, um, uh, the African free trade is already uh, um, being uh, implemented, but we should not forget that at individual level there are opportunities that should be tapped into. So I think that's the, the main message that I want to share with you. Thank you. Excellency, thank you very much. Uh, I think very interesting. Uh, allow me just to go into directly into a question that I would like to ask you here. Uh, you are saying about 100 to 120 barrels a day of oil production. Uh, 100,000 to, 100, to 120,000 barrels a day of oil production. Uh, my question is, uh, what is so far the uh, indicative or proven reserves of Madagascar that you think uh, you have. Uh, the next thing is uh, the growth that you are looking at and the per capita GDP, uh, per capita income that you are looking at, at for, uh, 800 to maybe 400 to 800 and probably uh, more double than that in the next 10 years. Uh, what will be the uh, population growth of Madagascar in the next 10 years. I would like to stay with those three questions. Okay. Uh, let me start with the last uh, question. We are now uh, 25, um, roughly 25 uh, million population, uh, mainly uh, a young population. Um, 
but um, the uh, demographic growth, population growth, is now at around 2.83%, um, which is still uh, high for the time being, but uh, uh, it's slowing down. As for the economic growth, uh, we are encountering this year 5.2% uh, uh, growth, and next year we uh, predict uh, 6% growth and that is a solid trend because for the last uh, four years now we are above 4% uh, to 5% economic growth so we want to reach 8% uh, economic growth by end of 2023. Um, that is important to mention. As for the production of oil um, that you asked uh, before, I think Madagascar oil is here. We and also I ask uh, their help on how they, because this is a PPP, this is a PPP uh, uh, project. Uh, this morning he already brought some figures on the uh, potential of uh, the production uh, for the next uh, uh, 20 to 30 years. So this is a, uh, a fantastic uh, opportunity my, for my, us. My first question, the answer, what is the total proven reserve of Madagascar so far? I don't have that figure for the now because this is a uh, just for one site because there are other also sites in the in the west coast of Madagascar but it's roughly um, more than uh, 58 um, million barrels yes yes okay. in more or less in that uh, area yeah thank you very much excellency uh, let me uh, turn to uh, his excellency Sakari Wargo Bubakar uh, his Excellency is going to uh, answer the question in, in French, I believe, uh, and I would urge you to use the uh, official translation equipment. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, His Excellency uh, to explain uh, what the High Council for Investors in Niger, Niger is going to be one of the countries that shall have the highest economic growth in the next 50 years, one of the highest in Africa. My question is, what is it that you, uh, Excellency, would see the relation or the relationship between Indonesia and Niger, uh, what it can do and how uh, useful this conference will be to determine what we can do in the future? Thank you, <coughs> Thank you moderator. As you say, I'm going to speak in You French. can call me Peter. My name is Peter. Uh, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm going to speak in French, so for the time being, uh, giving you the time to put your heads there, so I will start speaking in English uh, to locate Niger, because sometimes Niger is uh, confused with Nigeria. It's not the same. We are French-speaking country. Nigeria speaks English. We have more than 1,000 border uh, we share with Nigeria. A big, we call them our big friends. Uh, Niger is located between Nigeria and Algeria, Libya, Chad, uh, Benin, uh, Burkina Faso, and Mali. We have about 22 million uh, population uh, with a growth rate around five to six. Madagascar I was saying there are two, this high. Uh, we are around six, so we are going to work on it. And more than 17% of this population is under uh, 20. So you see the, the potential and also the challenges we have. Um, now to answer your question, exactly. Um, pour répondre à cette question, nous, nous disons que le Niger, sur les huit dernières années, a connu un taux de croissance moyenne autour de 6%. Nous projetons pour les deux Uh, années à venir, une croissance autour de 7%, et après, uh, probablement, nous allons aller autour de 10%. Qu'est-ce qui tire cette croissance Nous avons des investissements massifs dans les infrastructures. Uh, tout à l'heure, uh, depuis, uh, on parlait de, de la production de, de, pét de pétrole. Depuis 8 ans, le Niger produit à peu près 20 000 barils par jour. Dans deux ans, nous allons partir à 100 000 barils par jour, 90 à 100 000 barils par jour. Et dans les cinq prochaines années, probablement, nous allons aller à 300 000 barils par jour. Donc, euh, la croissance sera supportée 
par la production pétrolière, nous sommes en train de construire euh, un pipeline pour transporter le pétrole brut euh, du désert jusqu'à la mer. C'est à peu près 2000 km. Madagascar parlait de 200 km. Nous, nous sommes à 2000 km. Donc, vous voyez euh, ce que nous avons comme potentiel. Nous avons aussi euh, un potentiel énorme en matière minière. Euh, tout à l'heure, le directeur de cabinet euh, en a évoqué tout ce que le Niger égorge comme ressources minières. Euh, L'autre élément que nous, sur lequel nous nous focalisons pour pouvoir tirer la croissance, c'est tout ce qui est industrie agroalimentaire. Euh, Peut-être nous aurons le temps d'approfondir si on met en relation cette industrie agroalimentaire avec euh, l'âge moyen de la population et le taux de croissance de la population. Qu'est-ce qu'il nous faut euh, Maintenant, pour revenir à la deuxième partie de la question regardant notre relation avec euh, l'Indonésie, euh, ça fait bientôt deux ans, nous avons une relation très forte, en tout cas en matière euh, d'investissement avec l'Indonésie, spécialement avec euh, Wika et euh, Indonésie Exim Bank. Euh, ces relations, c'est d'abord sur les infrastructures, euh, probablement nous allons aller sur l'énergie et après sur euh, l'éducation et la formation Professionnel. Donc, nous sommes en train de réfléchir. Nous avons connu euh, une relation assez timide au début, dû au fait que euh, les financiers et considèrent des pays, euh, le Madagascar l'a souligné, euh, comme on appelle des low income countries, comme des pays à risque euh, élevé. Nous, nous pensons que c'est des perceptions. Euh, si Wika est dans la salle, elle ils peuvent en certifier depuis que nous travaillons quels ont été en tout cas les avantages et les, que nous avons tirés. Donc il y a eu cette perception au début qui fait en sorte que les schémas euh, classiques de financement prennent beaucoup de temps. Nous avons fait, mis deux ans pour développer euh, un projet, euh, je peux dire d'une envergure assez euh, modeste, euh, d'à peu près... 35 millions de dollars. Euh, si nous devons prendre deux ans pour développer un projet de 35 millions de dollars, regardant les perspectives et les projections de taux de croissance, je crois que nous devons travailler encore plus, euh, avoir confiance les uns aux autres et surtout travailler de façon innovante. Euh, Aujourd'hui, autour du panel, euh, nous avons d'autres institutions euh, de financement, en tout cas sur euh, le, le, le terrain. Comment euh, les entreprises euh, indonésiennes peuvent se rapprocher avec l'accompagnement de l'Indonésie Exim, euh, Exim Bank des autres institutions de financement sur le continent et dans les pays pour qu'on puisse accélérer le rythme de développement peuvent être une des pistes sur lesquelles nous devons travailler en tout cas au cours de ce dialogue. Pour le moment, je vais m'en arrêter là en vous disant merci. Merci uh, beaucoup, Excellency. Uh, Uh, thank you very much, Excellency. Allow me just to, uh, I got here on my, on my, on my uh, earpiece, uh, the interpreter said, how many barrels a day of oil are you producing? A thousand barrels a day? No. Or a hundred thousand barrels a day? Now we are producing around 20 barrels a day. How many? 20 barrels a day just for the local consumption. 20,000 barrels a day. 20,000 barrels, barrel okay. 20, Now, barrels. what we projected in the two, Uh, in the two years to finalize our infrastructure so that we can produce 100,000 barrels a day. So 100,000 barrels a day, that in is two, basically... In, in two years and in five years, yeah. 300,000 barrels a day. Yeah. I realize, uh, Excellency, very much, uh, I look here at the figures that I have, and Niger is going to be uh, one of the fastest growing, again, fastest growing population in the world. You will be in the next uh, 50 to 60 years, you'll be the ninth largest population in the world after Egypt. Uh, you'll be having like almost 200 million people. Uh, that is according here to the project, to the projection of the United Nations. Uh, you were talking about foreign borrowing. My question now is, is the sub-Saharan sub governments still able to do external borrowings as we see that there is a sudden surge in external borrowings in the region that contains some of the world's poorest countries, 
poor of the, uh, the least per capita income countries. Do you see an issue with these countries borrowing uh, from the international uh, uh, institutions? Merci pour la question et c'est là uh, tout le challenge. Tout à l'heure, nous parlons d'innovation en matière de financement. Euh, nous sommes un pays qui connaît un des taux de croissance démographique le plus fort au monde. Nous sommes venus en Indonésie et dans certains pays musulmans pour nous inspirer comment ils ont pu, en tout cas, contrôler euh, le taux de natalité et nous sommes sur ça. Nous étions il y a deux ans à peu près à 6% de croissance démographique euh, par an. Nous, cette année, ça a été projeté à 5% et nous sommes à peu près ça. Donc, le rythme de tendance baissière est en cours, euh, mais euh, ce n'est pas autant un handicap, d'autant plus que des politiques énormes sont en train d'être de, de, euh, mises en place pour d'abord contrôler ce taux de natalité, pour que ça n'handicape pas le taux de croissance que nous observons. Ça, c'est la première des choses. La deuxième des choses, c'est que euh, Aujourd'hui, pour nourrir cette population, nous avons mis en place une des politiques agricoles les plus performantes, je peux dire, de l'Afrique et du monde, reconnue euh, par la FAO et d'autres organismes. C'est ce qu'on appelle les Nigériens nourrissent les Nigériens. Ça, c'est la première phase qui va prendre fin euh, dans, un, dans deux ans. La deuxième phase sera l'industrialisation de l'agroalimentaire. Comment maîtriser cette chaîne euh, agricole de telle sorte qu'on arrive à nourrir de façon adéquate cette population en tout cas croissante, mais cette population autant aussi jeune euh, que nous voyons. Donc pour nous, euh, compte tenu de tout ce que nous faisons, la croissance démographique ne sera pas un handicap, mais plutôt un avantage, parce que nous avons commencé à les former et à les former aux nouveaux métiers, compte tenu du contexte euh, du TIC sur les, dans lequel nous sommes. Nous sommes aussi en train de, de regarder tout ce qui est, je parlais d'infrastructures, de production pétrolière, de production minière, d'industrialisation. Donc tout est mis en place pour que le risque perçu aujourd'hui soit un risque réellement faible pour que le financement soit le financement, en tout cas le moins risqué pour euh, ce que nous appelons l'international boring. Nous avons un rating malgré ce que vous dites, ce que vous regardez, par Moody's, qui est un des ratings les meilleurs de la, des pays de la sous-région, et même pour le rating du long terme. Donc nous sommes confiants, nous pensons que euh, les pays au sud du Sahara, même s'ils si sont perçus comme, perçus je le dis bien, perçus comme des pays à faible niveau de revenus, ça c'est la perception de certaines institutions, nous pensons qu'avec des façons innovantes, nous pouvons renverser la tendance et euh, véritablement en soumettre sur un rythme de croissance pour soutenir en tout cas et renverser la pauvreté que qui se perçoit. Thank you very much, Excellency. It's obviously a, a great, a good sign that the Many of the African countries are actually projecting what's going to happen with the population growth in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years because that is probably one of the biggest issues that probably need to be tackled and need to be planned. As such, I have started with the Excellency Minister of Finance of Madagascar, the New Excellency, and I have especially left our bankers here uh, as being answering probably the questions that you have. And I would like to first of all go to the CEO of the Indonesian Action Bank, Cynthia. Cynthia, call me Peter, please. Uh, uh, Cynthia, uh, I we have seen that uh, the Action Bank, the Indonesian Action Bank, has been has been uh, very active in taking a role, taking a part in the infrastructure development coordination cooperation between Indonesia and. Uh, and the African countries. Uh, I have also seen that uh, you are very much taking part in financing in, uh, uh, in infrastructure projects in Senegal, in Côte d'Ivoire, in Tanzania, and in many different countries. Can you tell me uh, what are the main ingredients for you to say, or the, 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 the supporting ingredients to say, yes, we want to go and we want to uh, support the Indonesian infrastructure companies to do more business in Africa. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, thank you, Peter, for the, for the question. Just call me Peter. Uh, yes. Thank you, Peter. Uh, so, so, first of all, for, for those of you who have not been uh, so familiar with the Indonesia Exim Bank, uh, Indonesia Exim Bank is really uh, wholly on uh, institutions, special institutions by the government of uh, Republic of Indonesia, which the mandate is to promote and support uh, Indonesian export to, to the global market. Uh, yes, uh, Peter, that uh, for the last uh, two years we have been assigned by the government to help support uh, penetrations to what we call it a non-traditional market uh, for Indonesia, uh, which is uh, among others uh, Africa. Uh, we actually, you know, for the, you know, we look into the trade between Indonesia and Africa. Uh, I think can we see, see uh, the slide before this one? Before this one, please, the operator. Now the, the slide with the, all the countries. Hello. Uh, okay, so just this, this one first. So Indonesia export and import from Africa. So we've seen that there is not much happening uh, for the last 10 years. Uh, in fact, in 2018, we have the uh, trade deficit, and this is uh, very much, uh, you know, concern uh, from the government that we really need to increase the uh, ties between the African as a, as a target market. You mean the trade deficit in general, or the trade deficit between the and African countries? Yes. Uh, in general. In general, yes, in general. And, and then if we see this uh, and compare with some other countries, uh, can we go to the next slide? Yes, please. Go on, please. Next, next slide. Next, next. Yes, this one. So if we see, if we can compare with some other countries uh, how the, uh, you know, comparable countries uh, uh, of Indonesia to, to Africa. Uh, we have a very you know, for the last nine years, since 2010, we see a very flat development. Uh, and we see that, like, even uh, Malaysia is almost the same as Indonesia, but they still have the, the positive uh, trade balance, unlike Indonesia. So that's why the government, uh, you know, uh, since uh, last year, have pushed us uh, to go into uh, African uh, market and providing uh, very support. Uh, we call what we, uh, you know in Indonesia we have this national interest account uh, facilities, uh, which is provided by the government through Indonesia Exim Bank in terms of support uh, for outbound investment as well as for the trade. So with that, we you know the first projects that we uh, did you know two years ago uh, we started the discussion with Niger first. So you know thanks to. Um, Mr. Abu Bakar, that uh, with the passion and also the passion uh, to work with us and with, with Rika, we finally uh, conclude the project and now I think that's becoming a footprint for uh, Indonesia uh, construction company as a model to get into the African market. And then with that development, we also go into some other countries. So we go to Senegal, we go to uh, Cote d'Ivoire and some of the projects, uh, potential projects in uh, Madagascar just mentioned by the minister just now, and we have also uh, a project in social housing in Algeria and some other uh, potential countries. So uh, I think for the last year, uh, one year after our uh, Indonesia Africa Forum, we have seen quite a, a good development uh, in terms of operations and how we should be able to support uh, various sectors. Uh, for both countries' uh, benefits, you know, uh, not only in the construction sector, but also in strategic industries where exporting aircraft, we're also supporting uh, the, uh, you know, the potentials in the pharmaceuticals, in the uh, other uh, strategic industries that Indonesia has a capability and capacity of having the collaborations with uh, so many African countries. So I think, uh, uh, Peter, that with that, uh, we, the Indonesia Exim Bank is quite confident that uh, for, you know, from now on, we should be able to support any 
potential African countries, and then we have to be able to try to find the solutions and uh, financing schemes that suitable and palatable to to the uh, host country. Uh, you know, similar to some other countries. As we know, that African countries uh, varies. You mean to the beneficial countries? Yes. The beneficial countries. So we have also provided uh, various schemes, you know, similar uh, to some other uh, exit banks around the world. And in addition to that, we just also launched the, what we call it the EPDF, the Export Oriented uh, Project Development Facilities. So we have been also in collaborations with the African Exit Bank and some other uh, multilateral to help, uh, you know, uh, us together to get into this market and uh, get the understanding. As yesterday we have heard from the president that uh, Indonesia this time around, and you know, we can say that uh, we should be the true partner of the African countries. You know, with the spirit of the uh, Asia Africa back in 1955, we, uh, Indonesia Asian Bank, as the facilitator from from the Indonesian side, and you know, uh, firstly with all the SOEs that uh, backing up all the uh, collaborations with African countries, we can convince the, all the member countries in Africa now that we really uh, very committed to get into this market as there is a potential and there is a, a strong uh, mutual benefits that can be, uh, you know, can be achieved uh, through a good collaboration. Let me interject here just quickly. You were saying cooperation between Exim Bank Indonesia with other Exim Bank of other countries. How can you point a little bit on that? Yeah, so for example, the one, one project that now we are discussing in uh, in Zanzibar, uh, you know, part of the uh, Union Republic of Tanzania. So the project is basically initiated by the African Exim Bank. Thanks, uh, Tama is here. Uh, you know, last year when we had the forum. The CEO of African XC Bank uh, has, has come to us and then uh, shared some of the projects. And then we discussed also the uh, tripartite with the government of uh, Zanzibar. When the president came to Indonesia and then they visit us and then we have a discussion. And then we, all the technical teams with Lika, African XC Bank, with Indonesia XC Bank, we, you know, we developed the, and discussed all the projects. and. And finally, we conclude that uh, this project is something that is uh, going to be materialized. So it is between exit banks of Indonesia, African exit banks, also developing countries, developed countries? Exit banks of developing countries? African exit bank is the... the yes. Yeah, but what about developed countries? Uh, you know, exit bank of European countries, exit banks of uh, American, of America, are you also... Oh, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. Japan, China? Yeah, we have we, we are very active in the global network of Exim Bank and uh, international development finance institutions. We have also Asian Exim Bank Forum, so we have a very close uh, collaborations with China Exim Bank, with JBIC, with uh, Korean Exim Bank, with all the Exim Bank in the Exim. To work in Africa. Yeah, we just need to have a, the, you know the projects that have a certain local interest or country's interest. You know, with the JBIC, for example, they are very very keen to work together with us so long as there is a, at least 10% of Japanese uh, interest in any projects that can be also collaborated with Indonesia. So we, what we need to see is really what is the really uh, the, the, the needs uh, areas, the potential areas that none of the countries can, can provide, can provide uh, service to the African countries. So this is something that we are now doing. Uh, uh, to see what is the, the real needs of the African countries that can be provided uh, by the value added process of the that is, that is very encouraging. Yeah. I have one last question. I saw in one of the presentations that uh, you are participating in the projects like the Senegal, in the Côte d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, in Tanzania, and the total of that is around $500 million, which seems to me like quite a huge amount. Uh, uh, how is that? Structure. Just quickly, yes. Uh, you know, uh, with, with the needs of the African, uh, you know, continents at the moment, 500 billion is not that big amount, uh, you know, for the African countries. But for the first uh, footprints of the. For them, it's not. For you, it's for you, it's not big. Yeah, for us, it's quite quite big, you know, for, you know, because this is just the second year of this initiative. 
from Indonesia, you know, as as a government support facilities. So this is quite something. Uh, how we structure that, you know, in various schemes. You know, um, first, what we introduce now, uh, we start by this year is the bias credit. So the, the, we provide the, uh, the lending to the buyers of the country. So we can structure it in, in, in that way. Uh, you know, in addition to the traditional Excuse me, the Exim Bank is lending to the buyers yes. or to the sellers? Uh, we can do both. We can do to the sellers, to the uh, providers of the services and the goods from the Indonesian side. This is not traditional though. Yeah. Because normal Exim Banks are actually financing yeah. sellers. Yeah. yeah, so we can do the seller side and we can also do the buyer side. Thank so you. That's, that's a, a, the new thing that we do this uh, for the deals that we did this yesterday. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Allow me just because this is going to be quite tight. Uh, time uh, time advice, but let me please go to Mr. Ibrahim Al Sukri, the leading head of the Indonesian of the Islamic Development Bank. Can you explain a little bit about your activities right here in Indonesia? Uh, not providing loans to Indonesia, but rather trying to see what can be done in the African Union. Is that correct? Yes, uh, I think uh, it's very important to highlight that the Islamic Development Group, as a, as a group, is basically looking at the uh, uh, economic development of our member countries, uh, of course, uh, poverty education, and also uh, improving the livelihood of our members. So, as a mandate, we have been operating for 43 years, and uh, we have 57 member countries. Out of 57, we have 26 African uh, countries as members, and many of them are uh, least developed countries. So, it is very, very important for us to look for Africa interest. However, uh, talking about uh, the general, uh, I mean, all would you mind repeating that just quickly? The, the number of countries that are participating. Sorry, uh, can you repeat the number of countries? Twenty-six, uh, twenty-six African countries is part of our overall fifty-seven member countries. So, huge uh, focus on, uh, on in Africa. In fact, last year uh, we uh, pledged over two point two billion dollars to Africa uh, in one year. For us, it's a very, very important region and one of the most uh, uh, active as a recipient region. Uh, talking about the, the, uh, the mandate of the bank or the policy of the bank, we have recently started more decentralization model and we have created five regional hubs in Indonesia to, uh, and moved uh, most of the operation teams in the field. So now we have a more uh, client-oriented uh, schemes, uh, more fast processing of projects, in order to cater for the needs of the, of, the, of the countries. And of course, when we operate in, in different countries, we look at the, uh, the needs of each country. So for Indonesia, for example, we have a five-year strategy with Indonesia that focuses on certain areas. And one of them, as based on the requirement of the government, is to enhance the exports and investment for Indonesia. So export to Africa is one of our mandates. Uh, how can we support the, the Indonesian companies? In Africa, we have four special needs for every country, but most of the time it's more there about capacity development, about infrastructure development, and also about special programs to enhance, like we were talking about Niger, we have uh, recently signed a big deal with Niger to enhance the rice uh, value chain, uh, talking about the agriculture, talking about the food security and so on. So each country has its needs. So back to your point, uh, for us, we are really working on Indonesia to uh, increase its uh, capacity and work in the different countries. And let me, uh, in brief, give you three products that it's very important to highlight here. One product is the South House Cooperation. We have a special program called Reverse Language, whereby uh, Indonesia usually is one of the most active uh, providers in this program. The IDB work as a facilitator, and the recipient country will also be uh, Involved. This is not just a technical assistance kind of uh, project, but also include that the three parties financially contribute, which guarantee a more successful program. And in fact, it's not just about training, but also go up to the level of implementation and, uh, and the execution of the experience of, uh, of one country to another. So uh, one simple example is that we have signed with Morocco to transfer the new knowledge of Morocco and the renewable energy to all African countries. 
So here we are not just uh, training uh, the CPU country, but also trying to transfer the knowledge. So this is one very important product. The second one is the insurance arm of the bank. Yeah, if I may ask you about this particular issue, you said you signed, uh, 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 you signed a contract with Morocco. Is that in relation to Indonesia or is that Morocco on its own with the, uh, with the development? No, this is, this is related between Morocco and, and African countries. But in Indonesia, we have, uh, we have a very successful projects that we are now replicating between Indonesia and Kyrgyzstan. We are, we are trying to replicate this between Indonesia and, and uh, Senegal. It's in the artificial insemination of the livestock, and we are also uh, trying to work on exporting the experience of disaster management from Indonesia to some African countries when it comes to flood and so on. So this is this is very very important because, like I said, it's not just a technical system; it goes up to the detailed uh, uh, implementation of the full model. Uh, the second product is the insurance product that we have. Uh, we have an insurance arm which is working on investment and export insurance. They have a co-guarantee platform in Africa and they have co-guarantee platform in, in, in Indonesia. And this is also important because the perception of the high risk of uh, projects in Africa and maybe the, the limitation on the mitigation products from the lenders. Uh, we come as a double A rated uh, agency uh, by all big four uh, rating agencies and we take the risk of these projects, which reduce the cost of borrowing for the transaction and basically uh, eliminate all the risks. So any contractor from here, from Indonesia, can go uh, to any project in Africa without having any risk because we are guaranteeing the repayment risk. The third uh, product is the trade finance. We have seen the numbers. Uh, we are also providing a number of schemes for uh, financing trade between our member countries. One of the most important mandates for us is the cross-border investment and trade. So we are providing the schemes for order for uh, uh, countries to export and import. And with this we are trying to minimize the middlemen which increase the cost and increase the time by providing these products. We have a project between uh, Africa and Indonesia and the cotton. We are helping uh, cotton producer from Africa to reach Indonesia. At the same time, we are developing the coffee exporters from Indonesia to reach the world and Africa by not just uh, enhancing the capacity, but also providing financing schemes for them to export to Africa. Africans drink a lot of coffee? Sorry? Africans drink a lot of coffee? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, uh, the, uh, the idea is that Indonesia is one of the best producers of coffee, but it's not branded, so we, we're trying to bring this to the market. Yeah. I'd like to ask uh, you, your statement about five regional hubs. We have five regional hubs in Indonesia. Can you explain? No, we, we have five regional hubs in Africa. Not Africa. Not in Indonesia. That's, uh, that's in, in, in Egypt, in Morocco, Nigeria, Senegal, and Uganda. And in Indonesia, we have regional hub here in Indonesia, covering Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei. But with the new model, we are all, as hubs, we are connected, very well connected, to not just to look for financing, but also to develop business. So whenever we see an opportunity to bring investors to one country or another, we facilitate this to our stakeholders, and we also provide the financing costs. Looking into the future of Africa's development, transport and energy, dominates the sub-Saharan African government budget allocation to infrastructure, mostly. The two sectors have the highest budget allocation during the last few years, and from what I can see here in the figures, there are over the $20 billion being allocated to infrastructure. How does your bank participate, or how does your bank look at this particular sector? We, uh, this, is, uh, this is the, uh, the highest sector for us in Africa. Uh, transport and energy is very, very uh, high in terms of their, uh, 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 from the portfolio uh, volume. So we are providing the, the financing, we are providing the insurance products, we are providing the technical how and uh, knowledge of uh, transfer of knowledge, and we are also, like I said, we are trying now to uh, leverage on our network to bring investors as well. So it's not just financing, we are now basically discussing in a very high level dialogue with many countries about their needs and we're trying to bring the experience. Today I was talking to Inca about how can we bring the, the railway uh, experts to Africa, financing, transfer of knowledge, and trying to find the innovative products, uh, like we said, alternative financing products, by having also some uh, blended financing 
by bringing some uh, grants which would reduce the cost of financing. So there are a number of issues that we are looking forward to. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm going to leave you for the last few minutes. So allow me to go now to uh, to address the question to uh, His Excellency Amir Kamal. Come on, if I say that correctly, who is the Executive Vice President of the African Exim Bank. Uh, you are saying there is uh, there's 150 billion in infrastructure yet, which is basically right now uh, that you can see in the African total infrastructure development. Uh, you are here. You told me before that Africa very much is interested in uh, providing financing to trade, and that you have basically trade fairs in, in, in Africa. Tourism financing is a very hot issue, and a issue that for you is very interesting. Would you please explain that? Uh, uh, let me just quickly by way of background because uh, uh, the Excellency mentioned about Niger, the confusion. There's also sometimes confusion between African Export Import Bank and African Development Bank. So uh, we also look at the African Development Bank as our older sister or bigger sister. So African Bank is uh, an African uh, trade finance uh, institution established primarily to promote and finance and develop intra and extra African trade and be a center of excellence in African trade matters. Now trade here is defined as both the uh, normal trade, the uh, merchandise and service trade, but also trade enabling infrastructure. So we do a lot of financing in things like uh, transportation, uh, logistics, anything that would facilitate the trade itself. Uh, now we obviously have quite a number of products and services and, and, and things like that which I can expand on later, but uh, for the specific question, we, we, one of the things that we also look at is uh, tourism. And of course, Indonesia is very well known for its tourism. Uh, Africa also has a good, very good potential. Some of it is well developed, others are not so developed. The reason we looked at tourism as one of the uh, uh, sectors we felt should be supported is because uh, the FX generation capacity and the number of people it employs. It's a very strong developmental tool in terms of uh, what it achieves uh, for, for promotion. So we developed a very innovative, we, we as a trade finance bank cannot really take construction risk, we don't understand construction risk. So we developed a very innovative product called Contour, which is construction tourism link relay facility. The idea here is that we bring an investor who's willing to establish a hotel or a tourist uh, project and we say, okay, if, if you come up with a hotel, if you build a hotel, and we, we, we make the specifications, once it's built, we will take the, the financial out, and then we will be continuing with the uh, uh, project promoter uh, to repay the loan over a certain period of time. Any specific country? Oh, we've done that in several countries. We've done that in, in, uh, in Nigeria, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Cape Verde, in uh, our, at least about seven or eight different countries, but I think the portfolio was about, about close to $2 billion worth of transactions and interest money. Yeah. Okay, you want me to go on with that? Okay. I'm going to give you another two minutes. <laughs> okay. All right, of course, the was just an example of some of the, uh, the innovative products. Obviously, like as many of you know, Africa is considered as a high risk uh, environment, so all our financing has to be uh, quite innovative in the way we do that. Um, so we, we really develop quite a number of uh, either direct credit facilities or uh, guarantees and risk mitigated material facilities. We have quite an extensive and uh, uh, elaborate uh, guarantee program, which we call a prison guarantee program. It includes both guarantees uh, as well as credit insurance. Uh, we also have uh, a lot of transaction facilities to promote uh, or support uh, project financing. We also do a lot of trade facilitation, and that's where we maybe can be a benefit also to some of uh, the Indonesian counterparties. Uh, we've identified lack of information as a key impediment to uh, uh, trade within Africa. Uh, so we've noticed even within Africa itself, where some countries do not know what, the, what their neighboring country is exporting, and they, they tend to basically be importing that from outside. So trade information is a key thing. We've developed a lot of uh, things to address that. We have a trade information portal. We have an advisory services that can provide specific advice on 
key markets and how to access those markets. We have, we've developed something called NASA, which is a, a customer intelligence repository uh, uh, that is used basically to address compliance and KYC issues, as many of you are aware. Compliance has really become a key problem now uh, or a key uh, issue for the whole of the financing world. Uh, many of the international banks are pulling out of Africa because of the high compliance risk, the perceived compliance risk. So we've developed that NASA to be uh, like a single source of uh, primary data required to conduct customer due diligence in Africa. The other thing is that we also do uh, an inter-African trade fair. We established the maiden inter-African trade fair last year uh, in Cairo in 2010. Uh, again, the idea was to try and bring uh, you know, buyers and, and sellers together uh, to get to pe people to know more about what Africa is producing and, and, and things like that. And it would attract uh, I mean, quite a number of uh, participants, exhibitors. Uh, we, we partnered with Indonesia Exim. They also brought in a number of companies and they came and, and put themselves there. I think that's a very good, good opportunity. We're going to do that annually. So the next one is in uh, next year, 2020, in Kigali, between the 1st and 7th of September. And I invite you know, all, all the companies, the regional companies that want to. Next year. That's the next year in Kigali. Awesome. That's correct. In Kigali. First to seventh of September. Uh, Where so will Indonesian investors or Indonesian uh, uh, business uh, entities be able to get the information from? Well, uh, through, uh, through either through the portal, through their participation in that trade fair, through uh, direct uh, contact with the Prince Bank to get specific, they want actually tailor made uh, you know, studies on specific markets and things like that, that we can all do. I have one last question, if you don't mind. Clearly, the World Bank, and I'm not letting uh, the Minister of Madagascar do, uh, I'm letting the Minister of Madagascar keep his comment on this, but the World Bank has played a very, and IMF has played a very critical role, sometimes very controversial role in setting standards for investment designs, evaluation, and implementation. My question, uh, I mean, what are the, are the African nations, will they lead, can they lead to the standards and principles that will be applied or is actually now has become the world standard? Well, I mean, yes and no. Okay, yes, in the sense that whatever is really makes sense for, for Africa will be adopted. Again, one of the things we always try to, to uh, propagate and promote is having our, our, our own standards, uh, Established standards for Africa. But some things simply cannot, cannot apply to Africa. You cannot take everything uh, that is just because it's, it, it makes sense. And a very simple example again is the issue of you know, the clean energy and all those kind of things. Europe and you know, the Western world has all developed, and now that they've developed, they're saying that you cannot use certain energy sources and things like that, right? Now, fine. I mean, everybody wants to have the, the you know, latest technology and energy and everything, but you know, well, these things cost a lot of money, so you cannot expect uh, a country, for example, that, is, um, that has the capacity to produce energy at a much cheaper right, but with slightly lower uh, uh, environmental standards, to be able to go just and adopt the highest standards because that's so that's so You're basically saying every country will apply to adopt standards that are actually applicable in Africa. Absolutely. And that's why we encourage the African Union to always have to be the sort of uh, uh, you know, guideline for that, to present the guidelines that, that are, makes, makes sense, sense for Africa. Thank, Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we will now refer to Lino, uh, whose name is Leo Dono Saputra. For those who are well, I can just call you Lino. Lino, uh, I read about your presentations. I read about the presentations with you basically are already starting to start a charter. And you claim some charters being the oldest bank here in the nation now, now that I'm not here no more. Uh, that you have been working on three or four party uh, arrangement in financing projects in Africa. Uh, one of those is when the Charter Bank actually already started with Denmark, the Danish uh, infrastructure companies. You want to do a copy the same thing here with Indonesia and Africa? Yes, thank you, Peter. Allow me a very brief context. I think Standard Chartered Bank, one of the oldest banks in Africa, is one of the... Uh, in, in Africa. Africa. In, in Indonesia. Africa. Not in we are also the, happen to be the oldest bank in Indonesia now. Uh, but I think the point to the that matters is that 
We're operating in across 25 countries in Africa. Uh, we're in such a unique position, particularly in facilitating and seeing how we can further help to foster a trade and investment relationship between Indonesia and Africa. Uh, just a quick comment from a perspective of what Colleen Minister uh, Luhut was saying, also he was in India earlier on, about the last few years, the, tr the trade balance between Indonesia and Africa has been pretty stagnant. Notwithstanding that, though, I think I'm quite heartened to see that behind that, actually there's a lot of different activities that's been happening. If you see that from an Indonesian perspective into Africa, we got not just SOE but also private companies operating in Africa. Uh, you saw in the previous session, whether it is mining, whether it is construction, the pioneering that even Cynthia and Indonesian Axiom Bank has been able to facilitate in Asia, I think that would pave the way, uh, as mentioned. But we also have private companies operating in Indonesia, uh, in Africa, on FMCG, Pharma, um, uh, and others. I think that's quite happening. Sometimes the number doesn't quite capture all of the activities on the investment and trade that are really happening. So potential is significant. If you look at Africa, uh, it requires a significant amount of infrastructure build-up. Uh, we estimated there's about 100 billion gap uh, every year in terms of infrastructure funding in Africa, so that's a significant need, cutting across power, sea, airports, uh, roads and railways. Last year, we see that there's about between 50 to 60 project finance deals that took place just in 2018 alone, and the value is about $100 million in Africa. There's a little bit of myth, perhaps, that getting project financing for projects in Africa may not be as easy, particularly for people outside of Africa. But actually, in reality, uh, it is very much doable. In fact, I mean, there's a lot of successes that we've seen. I'm not talking about Standard Chartered, but overall. I mean, a lot of international being one of the oldest banks in Africa, you probably will have one of the most best experience about how to deal Actually, as it happens, yes, we do. Last year, in terms of being the arranger, facilitator or structuring banks for project financing in Africa, if you will, number one in the world, among the other international commercial banks. So perhaps what I wanted to share just a little bit of perspective is that what would be the structure? Because India has mentioned quite a lot, and I think actually that in terms of multi ECA cooperation agreement, we believe that is one of the best structure and also from a pricing perspective, one of the most competitive. And the interests are going up though. It depends on which markets. Uh, here, interest is going down. <laughs> when we see actually the Fed's uh, interest rate, is, the outlook is going down. So that should be pretty good. I mean, it depends on each of the I always get confused when bankers stop. Some say it's going up and some predict it's going down. But anyway, I'll take you. I'll take you, say. <laughs> Thank you. Who are the actors? Where can we get liquidity sources? for any financing in Africa. So you got, who are the players? You got local banks. Typically in Africa, uh, the challenge would be on the quantum side, uh, depending on each market in Africa, because again, Africa is, is very bright. Um, you got international banks such as Salsa, you got the French banks, you got the US banks and others operating across Africa. You have ECAs. And Peter, you asked earlier about the European ECEs and the North American ECEs. They are very, very active in Africa. Uh, part of the Paris Group, in fact, actually, you know, one of the main sources of funding would be the ECA back in Africa. It's very interesting. If I look at what you have done on the 246 million euro that you actually extended to the country of Angola, yeah. you know, where there a lot of people were talking about political risk, about uh, environmental risk and what have you, and yet you still have been able to manage to put this together. Can you say something about it? Well, yes, the way that you structure it, obviously, number one, you are doing TCA as you've seen over that. So, um, that's actually credit insurance by the guarantee provided, but the guarantee is not just the Denmark ECA, UK ECA was involved because there's certain content actually that, and actually this is a, the important thing. How can you get multi ECAs to be interested in that, particularly the European ECAs? Many wouldn't necessarily realize that it's not just words or parts. So for example, if in Indonesia, Inca, uh, uh, our uh, 
car train producer is exporting the train cars to the African country. Uh, some parts of it can be made elsewhere. But the whole entire thing was made and assembled in Indonesia, yes, but certain parts uh, can be made in other countries. And if that's one of the European countries, that's how we can involve the ECA for that. Have you been services. Have you been involved in this? We have been involved in numerous schemes such as this, in fact, even services. So, for example, very typical, particularly in Africa, I think my colleagues Samir and Ibrahim actually would we know more about this. In Africa, you got the different types of ECA as not necessarily direct lenders. There are cases that you ECA become direct lenders, but more often ECAs, particularly European and North Americans, they become the guarantor behind that. So they involve international commercial banks as the actual lender. Now, in that structure, uh, you can see that even the involvement of that international uh, commercial banks that would count for certain ECA. We are a British bank. UK ECA would count that portion of our participation as services rendered by UK companies. So that way you can involve UK ECA. So it's not just a tangible hard group box. So I think actually that's one of the more sort of technical details. But the way that you structure it is so key in getting the most competitive pricing and tenor that is you know, feasible for the project in Africa. You also have cover from the other multilateral agencies. You've got MIGA to provide the cover. I think to your point, MIGA also played a part that provides the political risk as well as the casualties. The guarantee agencies, right? That is correct. That is correct, Peter. And we have also colleagues actually from the uh, development banks uh, that can participate. All of these combinations can work together. There are obviously pluses and minuses, benefits and so on, depending on the types of project, the tenor, how fast can you uh, put things into it, uh, and pricing-wise. You know, uh, just one thing, I read the presentation that said that your bank is paid for, particularly for this, for this presentation. How is it possible for the audience here to get a copy of it? Because I believe it's very interesting in the presentation that you actually made. Uh, yes, yes Peter, of course, uh, yeah. very happy to do will that. Be, will that will be real, available outside the door or somewhere? Uh, it will take a bit of time, but yes, yes we'll be fair. Yeah, it's very interesting. Gentlemen, I think we have almost come to the end of, of the session, but I would like to give, it looks that the bankers are quite optimistic about Africa. I think that the bankers are quite uh, positive looking at the development of Africa. I think it is going to be a continent that in the next 50 years is a continent that will grow so fast. It will have an increase in population number, a substantial increase in population number. It means that food products and agriculture need to be, uh, need, to be uh, need to be taken care of. It also means that as we look at the European countries, that sustainability and environment is a big issue. Uh, I believe that the population is the biggest issue that the African countries are going to face in the next 25 to 50 years. May I start with Excellency with you, uh, all the way up to Reno, what, what will be your last statement when it comes to development, uh, infrastructure development, population growth, and the challenges that you see on the sustainability and environmental issues? Merci beaucoup. Regardons euh, les relations entre le développement, le développement durable et la croissance de la, de la, de la démographie de la population. Je crois qu'en euh, Afrique, nous devons jouer sur euh, les trois bords. Comment en même temps assurer un développement harmonieux pour nos populations et nos populations qui sont en majoritairement jeunes tout en leur garantissant un avenir meilleur en matière de, de, de conditions de vie futures. Euh, ça, ça implique euh, des solutions, comme on l'a souligné, des solutions innovantes. Euh, construire, euh, investir dans les infrastructures est fondamental. Quand nous payons, prenons un pays comme le Niger, qui fait 1 million 260 000 km, où 
les challenges en matière de développement sont liés à deux éléments principaux. Premièrement, euh, nous sommes un pays continental qui n'a pas d'accès à la mer. Le transport revêt un coût de facteur assez important. Il faut alors construire, construire des chemins de fer, construire des aéroports pour pouvoir faire en sorte que on puisse évacuer tout ce que nous produisons, nous produisons vers les marchés. Ça, c'est un challenge important. L'autre challenge très important, c'est euh, l'énergie. Alors, l'énergie doit être effectivement de l'énergie. What about sustainability in environment? Je répondais à la question par rapport à l'énergie euh, renouvelable, de l'énergie propre, mais aussi de l'énergie qui se base sur. Euh, la mise en valeur de nos ressources lo locales. Le Niger est l'un des pays les plus ensoleillés au monde. Nous avons en moyenne 280 jours euh, de soleil à raison de minimum 6 heures par jour. Donc nous devons construire sur ce type de ressources pour que nous puissions soutenir le développement durable. Mais ce développement durable euh, doit tenir aussi compte euh, des aspects euh, de survie parce que quelqu'un qui, qui, qui n'a pas de quoi vivre souvent ne pense pas à, au futur. Donc assurer aujourd'hui tout en faisant, prenant en compte les aspirations futures. Donc développer les infrastructures, développer euh, l'énergie durable, développer l'avenir pour la génération future tout en, euh, en exploitant nos ressources actuelles. C'est important pour nous. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Excellency uh, Sakari Bukhar. And uh, allow me now to go and address or have the last statement from His Excellency Minister of Economic and Financial Affairs of Madagascar, Mr. Rali Amanda Trump. On the issue of uh, population, um, let me say that uh, it's not a burden, it's a fact, it's the reality. We have to address the issue of uh, uh, making people uh, happy, not making people rich. It's about well development, it's about well-being. It's about happiness to be on earth. It's about being together, not having lots of money in a bank account. That's not development. So when we look at Africa in general, but particularly uh, in the case of Madagascar, it's now development is not about uh, making the, the population uh, richer and richer and richer. It's making people happy to be together. And if I may say one thing on that matter, I would say I'm a uh, Minister of Economy and Finance that is much more keen into happiness index. Uh, instead of economic growth index. I'm looking at how many people are happy with the way things are uh, going on in the country, not at how many people are much richer before and after. So I think in terms of development in general, economic development in particular, we also have to look at the development of human capital. And in that sense, I think development of infrastructure is important, yes, but education, uh, training, um, making people and the youth uh, capable of taking uh, their future on their hands is much, much more important than anything else. Thank, Thank you very much, much Excellency. What a wonderful closing statement. Well, I would say Indonesia and Madagascar has a common future, um, despite the fact that it takes about 20 hours to reach uh, its destination. We have to look at the, the world as a global, uh, you know, arena where we can now, uh, you know, work and, uh, um, together. But last but not least, the issue about risk, it's just an, a perception. Risk is everywhere, not only in Africa, not only in Madagascar, in Asia, or other African countries. It's everywhere, including in the development, uh, developing, developed uh, countries. So we have to look at it, we have to address it. But the risk has to be shared, not only on the government uh, state uh, side, 
uh, some of the private side. And I think what uh, the CEO of Medco said this morning is the reality. So we have to share the risk, we have to take the risk, but it has to be uh, taken on a uh, realistic. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you very much, much. Uh, Minister. Yeah.
that it includes, uh, I think, also uh, fair and um, you know, uh, mutually benefit uh, engagement for any deals that we have uh, on the table. Thank you. Unfortunately, you'll be last to speak, but I'm sure that you have more to say. Yes, thank you, Peter. I think, first of all, sustainability is a huge agenda. There are two parts that I would want to classify this. One is sustainability in relation to financing schemes, and in relation to Africa. One, sustainability in relation to Africa. Two, is that in relation to financing scheme and in relation to Africa. One is that sustainability is inevitable. We talked about the major source of liquidities in financing capital projects in Africa. You got your export credit agencies, international development organizations, international commercial banks, and others. Most of them do have sustainability standards. So the assessment, whatever the project is, the assessment of the environmental and social risk elements would have to be there. It would have to be certain standards. So it's a must. But the second part, actually, that it also presents significant opportunities. There are different types of alternative financing, particularly coming out of Europe now. Uh, funds created specifically to invest into sustainability projects. And that is another source of capital that can be tapped in. The minister, the you must be very well aware actually about this a lot. This is the opportunity for a lot of projects in Africa that can be financed with, and it's not directly just into the younger energies projects such as affordable housing that can help uh, having very less impact on the environment other than cutting down forest trees and so on, but you got affordable housing. It's a sector that connects rural areas. Those would qualify into that sustainability related funds uh, project management. The other part is in Africa, one of the, the Africa's energy potential is Enormous, particularly in renewable energy. As an example, we know that the uh, one third of Africa's uh, electricity is produced to the uh, uh, hydropower uh, uh, generators, but the, the the overall potential is only 10 percent of hydroelectric power plants across Africa. So there's enormous opportunities. It is still very much there. It opens up from a commercial perspective, uh, uh, project opportunities. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Rina. Gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I just believe that this was a wonderful session, a lot of warmth. I feel there's a lot of warmth among the countries, among the participants in this session. And I believe that the bankers are looking at things very positively. That's the feel that I get now. Uh, I believe that there are a couple of things, if I may conclude, uh, that also the countries need to have a much need to create the stronger budgetary institutions. I think raising more revenues from countries' own tax benefits is an issue that we have not discussed, but I believe is a very important issue. And also improving the spending efficiency and especially the financing of African infrastructure. My only question is, can the world deliver? And by that, I would like to close this session. I thank, thank you all very much for attending the session. session. Gentlemen, Excellency Minister, uh, ladies, Cynthia and all of you, thank you very much for taking the time to be here. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, moderator.